So um, the past uh, four weeks, we've been walking through um, the middle of the book of Romans. And this week, we are not continuing to go through the book of Romans. So if you want to know how the book of Romans ends, you need to read chapters 9 through the end. I think it's like 14, if my memory serves right. Um, And if you have any questions on that as you read through that in your time, man, just ask somebody who's been following Jesus for a while and talk through it. Or you can feel free to call me or get in touch with me. I'd love to talk through the scriptures with you as well. Um, But I would encourage you to do that if you're curious of where that's going. Um, But today I want to talk about um, something, and I'm going to open it up with this, that that we've all experienced growing pains. So at some point in our life, uh, we were born, and we were tiny, right? We were a little baby, and then we grew. Now, I'm just curious, because I don't, does anybody remember experiencing growing pains? One, two, three, four... If, this isn't like anything to be ashamed of. Uh, like if you have, just go ahead and raise your hand. Like if you remember pain from, from growing, from your body changing. So a, a handful of us. So most of us don't actually remember the growing pains that our body went through. But we all did. We all grew. Some of us, it hurt. And we felt it and we sensed it, and we remember it. Some of us, it hurt, and we no longer remember it. And then some of us, we were just, I don't know, fortunate, I guess, and it didn't hurt to grow, right? So when it comes to, I've been in seasons of my life, or times of my life, where I've been in the gym, and I've been faithful to working out physically in the gym, and then there's seasons where it's not necessarily the case. And so I remember the first time I really took physical workout seriously, my body was just in a state of pain for like two and a half months. I just ate all the time. I was stiff. My body was just sore. But as I stuck with what was happening, as I stuck with continuing to to work out physically and continuing to experience change in my body, my body got used to the aspect of change. So I continued to still grow. I continued as I was working out to still gain muscle, to still lose fat, to still do strength in my heart, to still do all of these things. But at one point, there there was a transition Because in the beginning, it hurt, and I could tell, and I could feel it. And then it became just an ongoing sense of, I knew it was in my body, but then I finally crossed over to where I didn't even recognize I was getting stronger anymore. What are some other ways that we can think about this concept? Learning. Who remembers learning the ABCs? Who knows the ABCs? (laughs) Nina, your hand came up learning the ABCs. Is is English your your primary language? Spanish Spanish is your primary language. Has anyone learned Spanish? A few, a few. Most who have learned some Spanish remember learning, and Nina remembers learning the ABCs. But for our native language, do you remember learning the Spanish alpha- alphabet? Do you remember learning all through those? You have an awesome memory. <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous. She, she knows my whole life already. <laughs> for most of us, right, we don't remember learning the elementary part, but we all know how to use the ABCs. And if we try to learn a new language, a secondary language, especially as we're older, we remember all of the hard work and all of the pain that it takes, metaphorically, to learn a new language, right? So we can see this not just in physical aspects, we can see this in our mental capacities as well. So what happens for growing pains? What is this that we experience? Pain happens when we grow. So who likes pain? Right? 
Yeah. But who wants to grow? This would be a moment where you would, hopefully most of us would raise our hands. <laughs> so there's already a tension before we even start moving anywhere. There's already an issue that we experience in our minds and in our bodies because we know that we want to grow. We know that we want to move forward. We know that we want to develop. But at the same time, we also instantly recognize the one thing that we see is necessary for growth, we don't want to experience at all. So there's a tension that we find ourselves living with, and this is in many I would say all aspects of life when it comes to learning or growing in some area or in some thing. So we're going to read two scriptures from the book of Acts, and they're going to be on the screen. The first scripture that I'm going to read is found in Acts, it's chapter 2, and this is verses 41 through 47. And and uh, this passage here uh, is recording the growth in a picture of the, the first church, if you will, the church immediately following Jesus' death and resurrection. And this is a, a passage of scripture that I pray regularly for our church here as well. And everyone that would call Journey Church Bellevue our home church, this is what I'm praying for us all regularly. But let's read through this together. Verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church They committed to following Christ, and they engaged in church life. They were added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Verse 42, all the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So they committed themselves to some type of spiritual growth, some type of genuine community amongst each other and they contributed or contributed they contributed to community what is going on (laughs) they uh contributed to genuine community amongst each other but they also focused on prayer and we, we we spent some time focused on prayer this morning on purpose and we went through a series a teaching series in january about being focused in prayer and prayer not only means taking time to wait and to listen before the Lord, but also that we live a lifestyle of prayer when we respond to what God reveals to us in our moments of prayer. But they committed themselves to this. Verse 43, what happened? A deep sense of awe came over all of them. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers, they met together in one place. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and their possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. This was an intentional generosity that they they exhibited. In verse 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And this is the capstone moment. And each day, The Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And this is a picture of the first church, the early church, of what was happening in these moments, that God was using their community, that God was using their devotion to teaching, that God was using their devotion to each other, that God was using their position of intentionally being generous with one another, that God was developing a community of people that was so attractive that God, not the people, that God was adding people to their midst each day. That God was adding to those who were being saved as the scriptures are explaining. And this is astounding because it's not us, you and I, it's not individuals who add people to God's church, but that it's God who adds people to his church. But we participate. We participate in that. And we're to be used as as God's mouthpiece or as God's instrument. And there's plenty of other metaphors throughout scripture but we participate in what God does, but yet it is still God. It is not us who adds to his church. 
At the same time, in that participation, there's a responsibility to be a community of people that are ready to welcome the people that God is adding to his church. And so there's another tension that shows up because it is God doing something, but at the same time in our participation, there is a responsibility that we have as individuals, yes, but also that we have as a community of people, as a church, and that is to be ready to welcome people whom God may be adding to his church. And so this early church, as you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that they experience some growing pains, if you will. Or another term I think we could use is spiritual opposition. But as James writes, consider it joy when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Who knows it? What? Some of us. Patience. Perseverance. Right? And so we're back to that tension. What do we do? Because we readily admit that we don't want to experience pain. We don't want to experience testing. Yet, at the same time, we do want to grow. So let's look at some of the background. I'm going to breeze through this, and you can read, read through. This is particularly the first six to seven chapters of the, book of, Ap- of the book of Acts. But there's things that happened that were standing in opposition to the church as it grew. So number one, the first thing that we see show up in the, the record of Acts is persecution. And this isn't the full-scale persecution onto death, onto martyrdom. That actually appears later. But we see uh, a group of, of disciples and a group of people, more than 12 around 120 or so, but we see a group of people who have stuck with Jesus all the way through his death and now his resurrection. And we find them gathering together for prayer. And they're scared. There's a lot of emotion happening. They're not sure what's going on, and they're meeting together for prayer. And God shows up and miraculously in their prayer time reveals to each and every one of them that they all now have God's spirit and that Peter goes on to preach that this is a fulfillment of prophecy that God had actually promised, that no longer would God reserve his spirit for a few select individuals, but that God would indeed give his spirit to all of his people. And it reflects what uh, some of the spiritual leaders and elders of Israel had, had mentioned, that they wished that everyone would prophesy, that everyone would dream dreams, that people would see visions. And this leads us into the prophecy of Joel, which Peter is expounding on. This is a lot of knowledge, I understand that. So where we find ourselves is the church starts with this miraculous thing, and there's uh, just a, a booming that happens. And then there's a boldness that we find in the, in the disciples, in this group, that didn't seem to be apparent before. And then Peter begins preaching, and he doesn't stop preaching. I mean, maybe he goes to sleep, I think. Uh, but day after day after day, Peter begins sharing this message of Jesus. And shortly after that, Peter finds himself in jail. And then what happens is that Peter is miraculously released from jail. And we can see that God is, is moving and orchestrating events in the middle of opposition. So there's some pain that is, the church as a whole is experiencing, but there's growth that they're experiencing. The next opposition comes in the form of compromise. And there's a story that we find in Ananias and Sapphira And they are in the midst of a group of people who are incredibly, incredibly generous. I can't fathom, and I don't understand all the historical context, so it might be hard for us to relate. But can, as just a thought experiment, can we even comprehend putting ourselves in a place where every single one of us literally sold everything we had and put it in a big pile of money right here in the center of the building? And then we all shared from that. I can't even comprehend that. That's outside of our culture. 
Okay, now there's some prob there's probably some various reasons why they did that, and they were probably good and beneficial. But what happens? There's a couple who sees what is happening, and they want to be apart, but not really. And so what do they do? The husband and the wife, they step aside and they say, well, we actually sold it for 130000 but we're going to say we sold it for 100000 and we're going to give the 100000 and we're just going to keep the 30000 back. So the next thing to come at the church is this compromise. And what happens? This is crazy. Let me tell you what happens. Husband comes in, says, yes, we sold it for 100000 He tells this to the disciple. The disciple says, are you sure? You sold it for 100000 He says, yes. He says, you're not lying to me. You're lying to God. Boom, dead. Are you kidding me? They carry him outside and bury him again. There's a lot of cultural, con cultural context that I don't completely understand. Like, if somebody just dropped over dead, we would not just walk outside and dig a hole or throw him in the pond, okay? So, now that that's out of the way, we're not saying that this is the pattern for our behavior, but we're walking through a story. So he drops over dead. They do some things. Hours later, the wife comes in, has no clue what happened to the husband. Gives, did you sell your property for this much, and this is what you have. And she says, yes. And they go, oh, well, here's the warning that you missed. Your husband said that, he died, boom, you're dead. And God strikes down two individuals who conspired to lie, not just to people, but to the Holy Spirit. What is God showing in this moment that compromise is not okay? He's showing that compromise is not okay. We can't pretend to live a lifestyle of a church when we don't want to live as a church. We can't pretend to be a group of people but only have one foot in the door. God is calling his church to a level of holiness and purity and to a level of of fire and intensity that I think is challenging. And that story should be sobering for us. Thank God that when we tell lies, we don't drop over dead. Right? Thank God that there's grace. And I'm not sure why there wasn't in that case. I don't know. But one thing is clear, that God is setting up a pattern for his people. And then we move on to this thing that I'm going to say is distraction. We move on to something called distraction. We're going to read through this second scripture fairly quickly, and then we're going to talk for briefly three minutes, and then we're going to close. Sound good? Sounds good. <laughs> One sound good. All right. I, I guess no one's leaving, so let's do it anyway. Here we go. All right. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. And so before we go on, I just want to make a note that the problem that is happening here is a lack and a failure of communication. I don't know Spanish, and Nina, if you only speak in Spanish, we're going to have a really hard time figuring out what the heartbeat between what we are trying to communicate is. So let me rephrase what just happened. There were Greek, people speaking Greek, get it? Huh? You're speaking Greek, it's a joke. Uh, and then people speaking Hebrew, okay? There were people speaking Greek and people speaking Hebrew. Two languages, it's really hard for people to understand each other. And this was in the church. Verse 2. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. So there's one thing I know about the apostles. It sounds like, right now, it sounds like they're really arrogant. Like, we're not going to deal with that. Find someone else. It sounds like they're really full of themselves. But we know 
that these people who are quoted as saying this all literally gave their lives for the gospel. So I think we can remove arrogance from the equation when we're considering why they're responding this way in this matter. Does that make sense? Uh, that's just, a, I think, an assumption that, that hopefully we can share. Um, so what is happening they're saying that each of us in the church have a role to play, and Paul talks about this later in his writings. But each of us, as a gathering of, of a church, we each have our role to play. Let's continue reading on. Verse 5, everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, or Timon, Parmenius. And Nicholas of Antioch, I know, I'm sorry, but the, those of us who know Lion King have a, okay. <laughs> Timon, Pumbaa was, yeah. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to have fun. Okay. Verse six. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Verse seven. So, as a result, God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted to. So what happens? We see that there's an authority to execute a task. There's an authority to hand over leadership of a certain aspect of the church, of the ministry of the church. And then when that happens, that God's message as a result continues to spread. One of, one of my personal values or drivers is to constantly try to teach someone how to do something. When I worked in Walmart, my goal was to teach myself out of a job, right? You know, we've, we've probably heard that phrase and we probably roll our eyes when we hear that phrase like, yeah, but we all know how that, well that really works, right? But it's this idea that when we're all honest with ourselves, none of us will be around forever in the sense of this life that we're experiencing right now. Unless the Lord returns and saves us from death, we all will taste death. We went through that through Romans. We're not going to go through that. Again, it's this idea, what can we leave, though? We can leave behind ideas. We can leave behind values. We can leave behind things that shape people and move them forward towards the Lord. And so there's an authority that was passed on, that was given. So what does that mean for us today? Our, this passage of scripture, what can we see that's happening? We can see that there's a lack of communication. We can see that because of that lack of communication, that there's a failure in the way the church is literally administrating themselves. None of this sounds spiritual, by the way. So there's a breakdown in administration and organization within the church. And then they fix the problem, and then God's message continues to spread. And so proper administration and good communication, it helps the church grow healthy, and it allows it to continue to grow quickly. And so why was this recorded? Because this was a crucial moment in the life of the early church. It was a crucial moment in the life of the early church. And for us as a church... I feel like we're young, but we're at a crucial moment for our life in our church, okay? So what happens when we find ourselves at these crucial moments? What happens when we find ourselves experiencing something that we could call spiritual opposition, something that we could call growing pains? What happens? What do we do? Three things. We can learn to express trust in the Lord in these moments. Again, uh, we already talked through the Lord is the one adding to his church, not you and I, not in our own power. The Lord is adding. So we can trust the Lord to add to his church. We participate with God. We don't regenerate people's hearts. Only God does that. So we can plant and we can water, but only God gives the growth. Only God can reproduce the gospel in people's hearts and in people's lives. 
So at the start of our church, I was uh, specific about asking us to each begin praying for individuals, at least three, that we would want to see uh, come to a faith in Jesus Christ, friends and individuals, and that we would begin living intentionally. So going to work, going to work doesn't mean we're, we're spreading the gospel, but going to work intentionally can mean that we're spreading the gospel. Everyone goes to work. Most everyone goes to work. Or most everyone has an expression of work. Now I'm just trying to get too technical. Everything we do, right? We can all do it as an existence of human behavior and human culture, or we can do it intentionally positioned with our hearts before the Lord as an expression of worship and as a way to show and spread the gospel. Does that make more sense? Okay, so expressing trust in the Lord. So uh, one of the individuals that I've been praying for, I'm going to make up his name right now, his name was Kevin. I don't know a Kevin, and if I know a Kevin, this isn't about Kevin, okay? (laughs) So I'm praying for Kevin, and Kevin just, uh, he's, he's in a hard way, and he's looking for God, and he's searching for God, and we get together for lunch a few times, we're, we're talking back and forth, and then like Kevin like just stops returning all communication, stops responding back. It's like, all right, like I can't do anything else. I mean, if you don't want to return communication, okay. So about a month ago, somebody said, hey, did you hear about Kevin. For the record, generally, my response is whenever somebody leads with that question, I say, I don't want to know, <laughs> okay, generally. For whatever reason, I, I, I changed my mind. I said, no, tell me about, what do you know about Kevin? I've been praying for Kevin. I'm curious. They said, well, Kevin's in prison. I went, oh, really? Man. So what do I do? Now I know where Kevin is. I can get a hold of him. (laughs) And I don't know if anyone's ever tried to visit somebody in prison before, but let me tell you, on a personal level, this was completely eye-opening, and God revealed a whole new level of empathy in my life for people who find themselves in jail or in prison that I didn't previously have as a side note. Whole new level of empathy. So I end up, probably about a month goes by before I really figure out where he was at. When I was trying to find out, he was transferred. I end up writing Kevin. Kevin writes back. I get this letter in the mail. It's like, oh, okay, this, finally. And then I can't remember what I wrote in the message, but it was encouraging, but it was also a little bit firm because he's been trying to move towards the Lord and he just continually is making the wrong choices. He knows my heart, and we're friends from school. So I get the letter. I've actually given my heart to Jesus. God put me in this situation, allowed me to end up in prison, to give me a, the time out that I needed to wake up to my senses and realize what I was doing. Should things go well, in six months I may be able to, to file for early release may be able to get out, but Jesus has radically changed my heart. And in those moments, I don't know if we're honest with each other, but in those moments when you hear things like that, you go, did it really? There's another tension that we experience, which is going to lead us into point number two, is that we can learn to trust in each other in moments of pain in seasons of growth. We learn to trust in each other. And so I'm reading this letter and okay, okay, that's good. So I get a hold of the chaplain, and I call the chaplain, and he answers the phone finally after like the 12th phone call. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm trying to get a hold of of Kevin. He goes, Brother Kevin? (laughs) Yes, Brother Kevin. (laughs) He is on fire for Jesus. I'm like, the same Kevin that I know, right? Oh, this young brother's been on fire for the Lord. I'm like, all right. So then I I finally get in touch. I'm able to go visit Kevin. And Kevin tells me, you can see it. There's an excitement in his eyes. There's a a weight that's been lifted. Yet the scenario he's in, and he's very open about that it's not necessarily ideal. uh, 
But yet God has lifted something from him and he now sees and he's like, please contact this person, this person, this person and please let them know what is happening and please plead with them. Try to bring them to church. Try to do something. And so we talked through that and, and I, I tried and unfortunately none of them have you know, returned my contact and when we're not ready, we're not ready. Um, but man, there is an authenticity of what is happening in Kevin's life. And he says, man, I was praying for God to give me the Holy Spirit the other morning. And then I started praying in this spiritual prayer language. He's like, now I practice that every morning. And now there's a Bible study that I've started. And, and his life seems like he's totally different, totally new in the Lord. Such an exciting, such an exciting thing. So we can learn to ex- to trust in each other in those moments. And then number three, in the growing pains, we can learn to express love to one another. And so this is the idea. The central aspect of love is not just sacrifice. Because we can all sacrifice out of selfish reason and selfish motive. But a central aspect to love is, is sacrifice for the benefit of another person. And so how does this show up in our church? If we count the seats right now and we look around, we have nowhere for a family to five to actually come into the door and join us in worship. There's four. I know. But here's here's the deal, and here's the tension where, as a church, I think we need to be prepared to move or that we need to find ourselves ready for. When people come into the doors and they're, they're looking to learn about God or about Jesus, about his Holy Spirit, about how God is moving in their lives, something as silly as making people feel uncomfortable because they cannot sit together is an unnecessary stumbling block to the gospel. Jesus should be the only stumbling block to the gospel. Now, Jesus calls us to a high bar. And sometimes we just don't want to live up and agree to follow Jesus at that high cost. Okay. But when somebody's looking to learn about God or looking to learn about Jesus and they come in and they instantly feel uncomfortable because they're being asked to split up because if you haven't been to church, you're probably showing up late. When if you're showing up late, it means everybody in this room is already standing. So you literally cannot see any of the seats the moment that you walk in. And then it's awkward because it's a really close and intimate feeling that we have in this building. Right? Yes. Okay. So, a couple of remedies for that. One, find a new building. Please pray that God would reveal to us a little bit larger space for us to meet in. Have not had that happen yet. Number two would mean that we would consider going to two services, which is going to require a lot. It's going to require a lot of work and a lot of effort. But I think as we look forward to what God might want to do, I think we need to prepare our hearts and we need to prepare organizationally administratively, structurally, how we can make that accomplished. So if you would, if you would join me in prayer for our church, that God would show us what our next step is, that would be, that would be great. And so I want to thank you guys for coming to church this morning.